Thank you for watching this replay of Developing Inside Out Rhythm. Even though this workshop is not live, we still have great deals on rhythm bundles, and you can always send me questions via email. So I want to welcome you to the Developing Inside Out Rhythm. And like I said to a lot of people at the beginning, I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy evening or your busy morning and coming to this. I hope it's beneficial to you. And um, I promise to be as concise as possible. It's one of the things that I really um, think is important to do. And so I will do that without without trying to be too fast. So um, I'll try to make this as, as concise and helpful as possible. But thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. All right. I want to just start by diving in and talking about rhythm. I think, and I hope you agree, that rhythm is the most fundamental part of music. I think that even if you had and your students had the most beautiful voice and that you could play the most beautiful uh with the most beautiful technique and beautiful artistry at the piano or on your instrument. If you don't have rhythm, nobody really wants to hear you play or sing. It just doesn't sound like the music that we're so um, wanting to hear. Um, so without rhythm, I think that musical is music is not musical. And you can even kind of prove this when you take out um, when you take out melody from um, your your uh, music and then you have just rhythm left, you're left with something musical, right? But if you take out rhythm from melody, a lot of times it just doesn't have that same feeling. Um, so it only makes sense to prioritize rhythm if rhythm is really that important in music. Yet the problem is we seem to teach it alongside other things. So we don't really prioritize it even though it's this fundamental aspect of music. And so what happens is, yes, we introduce quarter notes and half notes and we have students clap the quarter notes and half notes, but within 30 seconds, usually maybe 60 seconds, we then have them put it in a piece of music and we say, okay, let's do this rhythm now. And why don't you also, uh, 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 look on, look at these notes and figure out what these notes are and where they are on the piano. And then, oh, by the way, make sure you have the right fingering. And oh, wait, oh, there's also dynamics too. And so we're stacking all of these concepts on top of each other. And we're not really working on rhythm, the thing that should be on the inside of students' body. We're using, we're, we're tacking it on to other things and not really utilizing um, um, just just using that as something to teach them and put it in them and make it a fundamental skill that then can come out in all of their music. So I think that students need to look at a rhythm and know how it sounds. Now you already know how to do that, but it's been years um, that you've taken to learn how to do that. And I think kids can learn to do it a lot sooner than we give them credit for. I think they also have to get past the count out loud stage. Now, if you're a piano teacher, especially, I know other instruments do this to some extent, um, but a piano teacher, especially, you know what I mean by that count out loud stage. That stage where you make them count out loud at the lesson, you tell them to count out loud at home, and then they come back playing a piece and it's quite evident that they did not count out loud. Now, what I've learned now that I have children that um, practice is that, um, you are lucky if that child, even if the most you have the most obedient student and the most wonderful student, you are lucky if that student has gone home and actually practiced 50 percent of the time that you told them to count out loud. You're lucky if that happens. Most students just don't do it. It's very unpleasant. It's hard for a lot of students. And I think we can get them past that count out loud stage a lot sooner. Well, this is actually how rhythm menagerie and rhythm manipulations all got started. I was really frustrated with having um, telling my students to count out loud and not getting the results that I felt like they needed to get at home when they were supposed to be counting out loud. So I wanted students, my students, to get rhythm in their body so that they could stop counting out loud sooner, so that they could look at a rhythm and know how it sounds without having to do the count out loud all the time. But the problem is I was using a lot of the resources that a lot of teachers use. I was using rhythm practice books and I was using ryth rhythm drills off of um, the Internet and even on my site. Um, and what I was finding was that these rhythm drills were very random. 
And so they weren't very musical. They weren't very pleasant to um, practice. And I began to realize, well, why do I have them do something so random when rhythm is so rarely random in music? What would happen if you put a piece of music in front of your students where the notes were random and the rhythm was random? They wouldn't practice it, would they? There would be absolutely no excitement or motivation for them to learn that piece of music. And that's what we're actually doing though when we do that with our students. Random is not fun. There is no groove in random. So it's a very unpleasant experience. My thought is that random inhibits mastery then. We're actually inhibiting them from mastering a skill because we're not giving them something that's something that's musical and something that we that they want to um, want to practice. And so they're not going to go home and practice it because it's not worthy of practice. Um, and I'm not saying every rhythm exercise is like that, but a lot of them are. And so you have these random rhythm drills and they're just not musical. Now, there is one reason that I think random rhythm drills are useful, and that is it's good for testing. So I even have 10 random rhythm drills on my website. They're levels one through 10. And it's to help my students um, and other students in our state to prepare for our state music curriculum. And I think using random rhythm drills are very beneficial for that because then you can really test to see if the student knows the relationship between, say, quarter notes and half notes. Um, and you can really test them with those random rhythm drills. But the tests, tests are not enjoyable and students aren't just going to um, have any kind of an affinity to practicing rhythms that are not enjoyable. So let me give you an example of a random rhythm. Take a minute just for a second and clap this with me. Ready? One, two, three. Every time I do this in a group of piano um, teachers, you think everybody would get it right. But you know what? This Rhythm, even though it looks easy, is so random that often piano teachers get it wrong. That tie across the bar line doesn't make any sense. Um, and there's just no groove to the music. And I don't blame you if you actually messed it up. Um, it's actually pretty hard because it's random, even though it's got these easy note values. And you could tell there was really nothing enjoyable about that. As a matter of fact, if you covered up your screen right now and tried to clap it back to me, unless you have some kind of a photographic memory, I bet you couldn't do it. And good music is memorable. Good music, you can hum afterwards. Good music, you feel the beat. It's not memorable. It's not repeatable, certainly. And it certainly does not have a groove. So I think that to get rhythm into students' bodies, we have to give them rhythms that are specifically composed to be memorable, repeatable, and to have a groove. I think that really careful attention has to be given to, um, to this by someone who is good at composing those kinds of things. It has to be something that makes the body want to respond. So it's not just your brain telling your hands what to do, but your body feeling like something in you wants to move and something in you wants to groove. I didn't mean to rhyme right there, but that was kind of good. Um, okay, so students have to move their bodies to get it into their bodies. That's my theory. Um, and I really think that, I think you would agree that when we put it in their bodies, it's much more apt to get in there, to become an innate sense um, of what they do and then to come out in their other music. I also think that hearing music while learning rhythm helps all these things to happen. And if you've um, watched any of the things I've said about this webinar, you know that we're releasing rhythm manipulations tracks today. And that's one of the big things about this, these, um, these tracks is that, let's say that the, the student doesn't even get the rhythm right that they're supposed to be clapping. If they're using the tracks while they're clapping their rhythm, they're at least getting this feel of this groove in this music. Their body's gonna wanna respond. And if nothing else, that in itself is helpful. Plus, when you put it on top of practicing a specific rhythm, that's also going to be helpful in putting it in their bodies. So let me give you an example of a musical rhythm. rhythm and I'm going to play, um, this is a track from Rhythm Menagerie. And if you would just do it with me real quick, that would be great. So here we go. Oops, hold on a second. It's not working with my speaker. I have to turn it back on. Reference my previous, um, <laughs> my previous little uh, comment about my computer not being 
Um, Hold on a second. There we go. Okay. Um, my computer died. If you came in on this webinar a little late, my computer died literally an hour before this webinar. And so we had major technical difficulties. And so we're kind of recovering from that. Anyway, do this with me real quick with these tracks. All right, here we go. Two, three, one, ready, go. <laughs> Okay, now you notice already that that's musical. I don't have to tell you that's much more musical than the other one. Um, you probably notice that there's also repetition in there and that that third measure has a variation on the repetition and all of that contributes to the musicality. But what you might not notice is that it was composed very specifically to make sure that your students make the first beat of this triple meter stronger. Because you know that triple meter is strong, weak, weak, strong, weak, weak. And so those eighth notes on beat three have to be clapped a little bit lighter. And what happens then when they come to the next beat of the next measure is it automatically feels stronger. So one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one. That is just naturally going to have this feel of triple meter, which is a lot of times hard for um, students to do, but that feel for, for triplet meter comes specifically because of the way that this was composed. So this is what I mean by musical rhythms. So why did I create rhythm menagerie and rhythm manipulations? It was to make practicing rhythms musical and enjoyable, organized and comprehensive, and to help ensure mastery. This book is carefully graded. Both of these books are carefully graded to make sure that the student has plenty of material to learn and that, um, that things are given to them in a graded way so that the most difficult of rhythms is not at the beginning of when they're learning these types of concepts. So rhythm menagerie and rhythm manipulations are our core curriculum. But you might wonder, you might say, well, I have rhythm cup explorations. I thought this was an important curriculum. So let me just say real quick how different these are and um, what the idea was behind all of this. Um, there's significantly more material in rhythm menagerie and manipulations than in rhythm cup explorations. For example, menagerie has 96 pages. Rhythm Manipulations has 84 pages. Rhythm Cup Explorations, the first book has 36, the second book has 16, the third book has 32. And even if you put all of those pages together, they don't even equal all the pages that are in Rhythm Menagerie. So you can see number one, that there's just way more material in Menagerie. So it's intended to be a lot more comprehensive and definitely sequential. Um, it's more comprehensive and carefully graded, like I said. Um, you'll see this in just a minute when we talk about the quarter notes and half notes, but we're not gonna give um, students a quarter note and a half note in their first, um, their first rhythm, one, two, three, four, one, two, because that's very hard for students. We would give them something easier, like one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, so that they can feel the relationship between those things. And so we build on that then, and then level two and level three, and we um, get them to a place where they're mastering them and they're not easily overwhelmed. It's sequential instead of jumping around. If you look over on the left side of the screen, you can see that Rhythm Menagerie goes from the easiest note values all the way down to polyrhythms, the most difficult of the note values. If you look on the right side for Rhythm Cup Explorations, you can see that my first Rhythm Cup Explorations is pretty steady. That is definitely a great book to start out with your youngest of students because it helps establish a steady beat, introduces quarter notes in a very easy way. But then when you get to Rhythm Cup Explorations 1 and 2, you can see that this jumps around. So in book one, there's both a unit on quarter notes, a unit on eighth notes, a unit on triplets, and a unit on sixteenths. And not until you get rhythm cup explorations two do you see a unit on dotted quarter notes or compound meter or quarters in three, four meter. And so what happens, the reason that I did it that way is rhythm cup explorations was 
always intended to be a supplement to rhythm menagerie and rhythm manipulations. And so I wanted teachers to be able to buy Rhythm Cup Explorations 1 and immediately have something to use with their beginning students as well as their advanced students. So they could use the quarter note units with their beginning students and the 16th note units with their advanced students. And then I created Rhythm Cup Explorations 2 to kind of fill in those gaps. And so that's why rhythm menagerie and manipulations are definitely the core curriculum and uh, Rhythm Cup Explorations is a supplementary curriculum. Now, if you only use Rhythm Cup Explorations, you will still see differences in your students' rhythms. They're very good. It's just not intended to be this really um, core, um, uh, comprehensive and sequential curriculum that really works to get um, the, the rhythms in students' bodies. All right. Like I said, it just helps uh, put rhythm in the student's bodies. It does that. Um, it does, you know, starts out with easy things like clapping, but then there's coordination. So there's two handed things as well as the fun with sounds pages, which try to work with other things within the student's body. All right, so Rhythm Menagerie is the first book in the series. So I'm just gonna quick you, quickly take you through this so you can see how to use it and uh, what it's like. Uh, this is the table of contents page. And just in case you can't read it, I'll tell you what's in here. There's a unit on quarter and half notes, whole notes, dotted half notes, quarter rests and ties, half and whole rests, eighth notes, eighth rests, and dotted quarter notes. You can see why there's 96 pages in here. Each unit contains an introductory page. Some teachers love to use this page. Some teachers don't even use it at all because some teachers um, realize that you know, your method book probably introduces quarter and a half notes. And so maybe they, they like introducing it with their method book. And so they might not even do the introductory page, but then you get into the level one and the first page is all single line rhythms. So they can play it with their instrument. They can clap it. They can count it out loud. Then they have two handed rhythms to help develop coordination and then they have these fun with sounds pages that I'll show you in a minute. There's a level two for the same rhythm concept. So it, they're just a little bit harder. Single line rhythms, two handed rhythms, fun with sounds. There's a level three, even harder. And then the last thing in each unit is the Menagerie Master of Rhythm Certificate. So here is unit one, just so you can see what this looks like. Every introductory page has a beautiful picture of some kind of really interesting or unique animal. And this is the tarsier, which has become the mascot of Rhythm Menagerie. And the tarsier is just a fascinating um, animal. Um, it's one of those animals that can turn its head 180 degrees. So it can have its body be completely still and see completely behind it. So that's kind of fun. Um, on the introductory page, you notice there's only one rhythm. So you can work on this one rhythm with the student in the lesson. And then there's different things for them to do for five days of practice. And so those um, can be done. You could skip them completely. But it's just the idea is that you only give them one uh, rhythm. And that way they're mastering that rhythm and you don't send them home with a bunch of rhythms that may not go so well. Um, then there's the level one. You can see that um, very, these are very easy rhythms. One, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, four. And I'm counting all different ways tonight because this curriculum is intended to be very flexible. It doesn't tell you how to count. So you can choose however you want to count with your students. You can see on the top line of this, um, there's right, right, left, left, right, right, left, left, right, 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 left, left, left. So very easy um, for students to do. On these um, single line and two handed pages, um, there's always something on the side called the measure of progress. And this is one of my favorite things. Um, the measure of progress asks them to put a quarter note in for every day that they practice. And then at the end of the week, when they come back to lessons, they're supposed to count the quarter notes and put the number at the top part of the time signature, which obviously teaches them about time signature. Now, if they practice for four days, great. Everything's just as they expected. But what if they practice for five days? Suddenly they're putting something in their time signature and you're going to have one of two responses. The first response could be they don't say anything about it because they just think it's perfectly normal. And that's what we want. We don't want them to look at a um, time signature of 5-4 in a couple of years and say, oh, what do I do? What do I do? Um, so you, that would be great if that happens. Another thing that might happen is that they would put the five there and go, wait, is that possible? Or maybe a seven there even. What is that possible? I had a student one time that um, said to me, um, 
What about if I put a quarter note in for every time I practice instead of every day I practice? And one thing that is really important in teaching that I'm sure you know is that if a student has an idea, if it's all at all possible to do it and still accomplish what you want, want by all means say yes. And so I was like, uh, okay, sure. And they came back with a measure of 21 over four. Now you can bet that that started a really interesting conversation with us about, is that even possible? What would you do with 21 beats in a measure? Do people even do that? So it's a really great conversation starter and also a way of helping them understand about how meter works. And then at the bottom of each of these pages, there's a little mini certificate of completion. They can sign their name if they think they've completed it correctly. And then you can sign off on it if you think they've completed it correctly. Uh, the Fun With Sound Pages um, tries to get the student to do something a little bit unique, something that's surprising. And kids love to surprise people. They love to surprise their parents. They love to do something unexpected. Now, this one's very simple. It's just a simple one where they clap and they knock. Um, so if you want to try it with me real quick, I don't have tracks for this one, but here we go. One, two, ready, go. Clap, 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 and knock. I actually do have tracks for it. There are tracks available. I just don't have them queued up, so we're not going to do them. Um, but anyway, so that's just a very simple menagerie page, um, fun with sounds page. I'll show you some of the other ones in a minute. Okay, so this is level two. And remember, level two does the same thing. It starts out with single line rhythms, and then it's going to do two-handed rhythms. You notice when we do two-handed rhythms that the left hand starts first. So left, right, right, left, right right, left, left, right, right. And that helps develop that feeling of strong, weak, weak, strong, weak, weak in the students. And then there's another fun with sounds pages. And then we come to level three. Now this introduces syncopation to them. They would not be very successful with this rhythm if we did this rhythm first. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. That's really hard for students at first. And so when you actually do it in level three, they're ready for it because you've been practicing it. And then of course, there's the two-handed rhythms using those kinds of rhythms. And then there's the fun with sounds pages. All right, so I'm gonna have you look real quick at this fun with sounds um, thing. And what we're gonna try to do right now, this didn't go as well in the first um, webinar, so we're gonna see what happens. We're gonna start this video because it's a video of a bunch of these things and it's easier to just play it and um, show you. So I'm gonna start a video and we'll hope that it plays well. So this is example, these are examples of fun with sounds pages. So here's some samples of the Fun With Sounds pages. I'm going to be doing this unit one, level three. This one involves the student going, whoo, whoo, anytime there's an X. Um, and anytime there's an X on any of these Fun With Sounds pages, that means something, either it's an animal sound or a specific thing that they're supposed to do. And it's very clear on each page what they're supposed to do. So here is track, this is the medium tempo track for unit one, track three, or level three. Now the next one has students beating their chest to the rhythm and using gorilla sounds. And so if you could actually um, join me so I don't feel quite so strange doing it by myself, that would be fabulous. All right, here we go. One, two, three, four, one, two, ready, go. <laughs> Me, 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 me. 
Now you'll notice that some students are more introverted and don't want to do those gorilla sounds and that's perfectly fine. Please be flexible with your students. They can still beat their chest because that gets the rhythm into parts of their bodies instead of just doing it with their hands. We want to do this a full body sort of exercise when we do the fun with sounds pages. Now this last one is tons of fun, but it's more fun when you actually have somebody to high five with. And so you're going to have to pretend, assuming that you're by yourself, you're going to have to pretend that you're my person and we're high fiving together. So the next one sounds like this. Two, three, four, one, two, ready, go. Very good. All right, now that may not have been a perfect experience for you all, and I'm sorry if the the audio didn't quite match the uh, visual. So um, sorry about that, but I wanted to get, let it keep playing because that was the best way to show you how those things all go together. And so hopefully you got the general idea um, how it was supposed to go. And I do have a backup plan in case my other videos don't work. That was the one I didn't really have a backup plan for. So hopefully you got the um, idea. All right, at the end of each unit, um, we have a Menagerie Master of Rhythm Certificate. And I told my artist, as you probably know, if you've uh, um, followed Compose Create for a long time, um, I hate traditional certificates. I just think they're really boring. Um, there's a place for them, sure. And I know I liked getting them to some extent as a kid, but I really wanted this to be something really worthy of a student's attention. I wanted them to be like, wow when they saw it and so he developed these certificates that are absolutely gorgeous and they feature the animal on it that we featured in the particular um, um unit so um you can see these beautiful bunnies and then this beautiful um this beautiful bird so um they're just gorgeous and um, i think students really like the way they they look so um obviously i'm the author and composer of this and so i could tell you what i think about this all day long but i would encourage you to look at the reviews and the rhythm menagerie page you'll get a lot of ideas about how um teachers are um are doing this and how are they're using it and whether they like it or not. I'll just read a few of them for you. Teddy Carr says, I've had so much success with Rhythm Menagerie. It's hard to believe how eager they are to count out loud, clap, tap, etc. It's been fabulous. Diane Heidi says, I love these. Each set meets a need for fun and rhythm. Seriously, they're great. Lori says, this is a wonderful resource to solidify every student's sense of rhythm. I've just begun using it after thinking about it for a long time. I don't know why I waited so long. My students are loving it and I know it's helping them. Even students who have never counted out loud before are doing so with Rhythm Menagerie. And then Sheree Naquin says, this is really a huge learning tool and lots of fun. Every elementary school should have this as a precursor to their band programs. All right, so after Rhythm Menagerie comes Rhythm Manipulations. And today we're releasing not only Rhythm Manipulations accompaniment tracks, but we're also releasing a new edition of Rhythm Menagerie. So you want to hang on if you have the old edition. If you purchased it before last week, you have the old edition. Um, and we'll tell you how the new edition is going to be made available. So this picks up right where Rhythm Menagerie left off. It's designed especially for preteens, teenagers, and the mature. So we didn't put any of the funny little animal sounds or cutesy little things in it. These are all things that teenagers um, have fun doing. And then, of course, younger students love doing what teenagers do. So it, this is a book definitely that appeals to all ages. Um, you can see in the table of contents, or maybe you can't, I'll read it to you. There's cut time, compound meter, eighth note triplets, 16th notes, 16th notes expanded, because there's lots of ways to do uh, 16th notes, dotted eights, and then a whole unit on polyrhythms, two against three, and then three against four. And I have some a special discovery I want to show you about that unit. Each unit contains the same things as Rhythm Menagerie in the same orders. The only thing that's different is instead of calling the 
fun with sounds pages, fun with sounds, that's too cool for teenagers. Um, we called them rhythm maneuvers. So we advanced everything and made everything sound much more mature, even in what we call it. All right, here's the introductory page, for example, for cut time. And um, you can see that there's a lot of information on this page. Again, teenagers are more interested in how something works and why it works and all the explanations. Some of them are, some of them aren't. So we included all that, but they may not want to even read it. You may not want to even use it. That introductory page is something that is just up to you how you introduce it. Um, cut time, you can see it begins very easy because in cut time, you have to be able um, to learn to count in two and learn to feel it in two. So we start out with basic rhythms. One and two and one and two and one and two and one and two. And obviously these are going to be faster when we put the accompaniment tracks with it because you want them to feel it in two beats a measure instead of just one. I'll show you what those accompaniment tracks look, uh, sound like here in just a minute. Now the measure of progress on the side like you saw in Rhythm Menagerie is a little different. This measure of progress has you um, draw a note head in for every day that you practice. And then at the end of the week, they're supposed to put it together in some way that equals cut time. Now, that's kind of like a little bit of a math puzzle, and it's kind of challenging, and students like, especially teenage students, like to figure it out. And so it's an interesting way to see if they really understand what cut time is all about. And then down at the bottom, we don't have a mini certificate of completion that seemed a little bit childish. And so we just did a little task manager and you may or may not use that, but that's just something that's on the page. Then you get to the rhythm maneuvers and all of these are different, of course. Um, um, they're going to be something that's mature and easily um, convincible uh, to teenagers. But you notice that the artwork on these rhythm maneuver pages changes. And the artwork in this whole series is designed to graphically illustrate something about the rhythm concept. So in cut time, all the artwork that's been on the pages before suddenly is cut in half, right? Or just shift it a little bit. So it's cut in some way. So watch for that as we're going through the book. All right. Level two cut time is obviously going to be a little more complicated. You've got eighth notes now. So one and two and three, or sorry, one and two and one and two. And then it goes on from there. Um, the two-handed rhythms like that, again, having eighth notes in it because it's a little harder. Um, and this one, you can see there's a little funkiness in the cut um, out of the artwork here. This one has a switch. And traditionally, pre-COVID and post-COVID, um, this is what you would do. You would uh, hold your students, or excuse me, your hands out, and your student then would tap in your hand the first measure. And then you'd flip at the bar line. So we say switch on the track. And then you tap into their hand, and then you flip and you tap into your hand. And so it would go one and two and switch. Da, 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 switch. Da, 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 da. That switch them. Dum, dum. And so now with COVID, there's all kinds of different ways of doing this, or I should say there are ways that we can figure out to do this kind of thing. So what we did since we're doing, we did these revisions during COVID um, quarantining is we put in suggestions for alternate activities. And so in this case, one of the things that they could do is have all the students, if you're doing this in a group, you could have all the students facing one way and then their mouths are all facing away from each other. And then you could just have them do little you know, like little karate chops on their back. One and two and da, 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 switch. And then see if they can turn around and switch. Now, they probably won't be able to do it with the fast track, but they probably will certainly like to try. Um, so we put some of these um, alternate activities, like instead of high-fiving, we put an air five. Um, and that way it normalizes what they need to do with social distancing. And then even after COVID, please let there be an after COVID. Um, even after COVID, these are definitely alternate activities that you can use and they won't seem odd. Um, so the Air 5, you could actually do um, online. And even though you'll be a little bit off from them, you can still do this kind of thing with the Air 5. And I'll talk a little bit more about how to adapt this for online lessons here in just a minute. All right, this is the level three um, cut time page, and you can see it's gotten more difficult. One and two and one and two, and with that um, dotted eighth note, or excuse me, dotted quarter notes. Two-handed rhythms, and then this one is the um, 
the level three rhythm maneuvers. Again, you can see the artwork got all chopped up here. This is the menage, not menagerie, the manipulations master of rhythm certificate. So you can see how that one kind of reflects how that certificate reflects um, the fact that this is cut time. Here's another example of a, man a manipulation certificate. And um, this one is depicting the dotted eighth note. So you can see the dot clearly. You can see the dark line that represents the eighth note there. And then can you see the double line there at the end? That represents that 16th note that usually has to happen at the end of a dotted eighth note, just at least in these um, earlier earlier um, rhythms. Now, the triplet um, certificate, this one's the most interesting to me. Um, we were trying to figure out how to depict this visually. And the artist was talking to me about how um, how the first rhythm in this unit was, and it was um, quarter, quarter, triplet, quarter. And so he was um, asking, you know, how we should depict that. And I said, well, in 4-4 four, four timing, um, we have strong, weak, medium, weak, strong, weak, medium, weak. And so he says, okay, well, I'll make the first line strong. So I'll make it a dark color. And then that white will represent a weaker feeling. And then that third line will be a kind of a, a medium sort of color. And there'll be three parts to it. And so that represents the triplet. So if you look at that and kind of try to clap what that represents, strong, weak, Da, 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 strong, we, and it just repeats after that. Now, this is not something that I would necessarily expect you to pick out or the student to pick out, but now that you know it's there, you can probably pick out these really interesting parts about the um, artwork, and I just thought I'd mention that because it really is unique and fun and um, kind of challenging to see how it all relates. All right, again, these are what other teachers are saying. Edna says, I recently used rhythm manipulations for an advanced rhythm class for high school through adult students. It was not only very effective, <clears throat> excuse me, due to the excellent sequencing, but also quite enjoyable. I've done plenty of rhythm activities with many groups, and this one has moved to the front of the line right along with rhythm cup explorations. WH says, I would be tearing my hair out if it wasn't for menagerie and manipulations. They've made my life so much better. After six months, two of my rhythmically challenged transfer students are beginning to play rhythms correctly the first time. Betsy says, my intermediate level students don't like to count out loud. Nobody does. But with rhythm manipulations, they learn how to count to get it right. Manipulations has been a great value and fun for students to use with many positive benefits for my students. And then Jennifer, such a time saver for me. Manipulations is a fabulous resource for a wide range of students, carefully graded so students never feel overwhelmed. And that was my goal. Um, the average student can use it. The slower student can use it. The more advanced student can use it, but it's carefully graded to help them not feel overwhelmed. All right, let's talk about the accompaniment tracks real quick. All right, so, oops, I'm sorry. Ah, I don't want to start the accompaniment tracks yet. Just a minute. Um, I think these accompaniment tracks and just music in general is integral to feeling the beat and getting rhythm into students' bodies. We mentioned that at the beginning. Um, the tracks, there's three tracks for every line of music. There's a slow, a medium, and a fast track. And by slow, I mean slow. Slow is slow, but fast is challenging. Now, the slow track is slow enough that it's still doable by young students and students who haven't had the rhythm before, but it's not so slow that you lose the musicality. You'll see in one of these recordings, or uh, we'll do it with a plan B if we need to, you'll see that there's actually something too slow. <laughs> you can make music so slow that you no longer feel where the beat really is. And so um, these were, you know, I, I wrestled with this a long time um, to see which uh, tempos would work. Um, but the fast one is going to be challenging challenging. We intended it to be challenging because teenagers love challenges. It's really fascinating watching my own teenager challenge himself to do different things and to do them better and better and better. And they would like nothing more than to do the rhythms even better than you. So even if you can't do the fast track or if you struggle with the fast track, don't be embarrassed about that at all. Let them do it and they will feel wonderful. It doesn't mean you're a bad teacher. It just means they're challenging tracks and maybe they're a little hard. Um, I think you can probably do them, but I'm just saying that the challenging ones really are intended to be challenging. So the point is, pick the tempo that's best. 
don't think that with three tracks, the goal is to always get to the fastest track. That is not the goal. The goal is for the student to play the rhythm accurately and with a sense of musicianship. Um, you can always come back and challenge them when they're older or better with the rhythm to play it faster if you'd like, but they don't have to get to that fast track. If they can only do the slow track, that's fine. If they can only do the medium track, that's fine too. Um, and this is important because younger students typically aren't physically able to do super fast speeds. And I, I noticed this watching my own child go through rhythm manipulations before we had tracks and then the summer as we were testing them doing the tracks. Um, it was really fascinating to see that it was just not in this case, this student was my child, was not physically able to do them super fast. Um, and so those younger students just need more coordination and um, they need more practice to get them fast. So it's okay for them to only do the slower tracks. We have to train our students to use appropriate amounts of energy for small note values. So for example, if you're clapping two quarters, a group of sixteenths and a quarter note, your students can't give the same energy to 16th notes as they give to the quarter. So they can't go one, two, da, 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 da. <laughs> I, you know, I'm a musician, so I really force that to try to be um, fast enough, but more than likely they're gonna go one, two, right? And it's not gonna be fast enough. It's not gonna be accurate because they're giving too much energy to those 16th notes. So we have to train them to do lighter, um, smaller note values. So bum, bum, so you notice my hands aren't even coming apart that much when we're doing the uh, smaller note values. They're bigger when we do the big note values, but when we do those small note values, your hands have to be, um, just have more of a micro sort of look. So um, we have to train our students to use appropriate amounts of energy for each of the tempos and each of the note values. But again, I put this in here twice for a reason. Pick the tempo that's best. Don't feel like you have to push them for the fast tempo. Okay, so I'm gonna show you one of these tempos. Hopefully this video with, will work. If it doesn't, no big deal because we can use our plan B. So let's try this. This is one in nine, eight time. All right, here we go. Ready? This is the slow track, which is just fast enough to get that feeling of compound time and yet slow enough to allow younger students and students being first introduced to compound time for the first time to be able to do it well. So here we go. Two, three, one, up, one, two, 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 three. woodblock sound when the right hand is supposed to be tapping and a lower woodblock sound when the left hand is supposed to be tapping. So the students can always check to make sure that they have the right rhythm. They can do that with the first two tracks of each line. Here's the second track, which is a medium speed. I'll tap softer so you can hear the taps of the woodblocks. tempo is. This is the fast tempo. No wood blocks this time. So still doable, but pretty fast of a clip for compound meter. All right. Now I'm not sure how well the video played. I've got a moderator. Um, that is moderating this and nobody's saying anything in the chat. So I assume it's going okay. But um, if you could just quickly put in a little comment about whether or not the video is okay for you or not, I would really appreciate that, good or bad. Um, and I'm gonna let the moderator sort of um, let me know then if I should do this, try to do this live or not. Trying to do it live is fine. Um, it's just, I take a drink of water during this time. So, um, so um, so it's helpful to me to actually play the videos and gives me a little bit of a break. So um, so anyway, I'll let the I'll let the moderator tell me um, whether or not to do this um, 
live or if we can keep playing the video. So let's keep going though for now um, until everybody gets a chance to comment. Um, and here is three, four timing. So um, it looks like everybody's saying that it's good. So we're gonna go ahead and go with three, four timing. Here's a video on this one. And try, if you can, go ahead and clap with it and see if your body responds to the rhythms and the music. All right, thank you so much. So many of you weighing in and letting me know that the video is working just fine. Thank you so much. Lots of questions about how this works for, for Zoom and things like that. So hang on to those questions. I'll give you some ideas about that here in just a few minutes. All right, this is from the 16th um, uh, unit. And so let me play this one for you. This one's a fun one. It's got a nice little groovy track. All right, so you get the idea of how that works. Just lots of fun, um, snappy fun. Um, this one sounds like a movie soundtrack. I told the person who um, who created these tracks, by the way, I M Music, I M M U S I C is the company that worked with me to do this. Really wonderful guys to work with. And um, anyway, I told them that this sounded a little bit like a Harry Potter-esque sort of um, thing. So there's movie music kind of sounding things in this one. All right, here we go. Here's the medium track for this page. Two and three and four and two hands, two and ready. Music in it. Isn't that fun? I love these tracks. They're just so much fun. And it just brings a whole different level of musicianship and musicality to the rhythms themselves. We, we, um, I think I said this before, but we've released a new version of a new edition of Rhythm Manipulations. And one of the things I did was go back through them and make sure the rhythms were as musical as possible. So I revised a number of rhythms. And that's one of the revisions that you'll see in the revised edition. Again, I'll tell you in a minute how to get that if you already have the old version. OK, so this one is um, um, one that de deals with dotted eighth notes. Here we go. This is a groovy sort of one um, in triple meter, and this is the medium tempo. Two, go. <laughs> get 
get trickier and trickier, but definitely still always musical. All right. And I noticed a couple of people saying, oh, no, I need to work on that last one. Don't feel like you have to play these perfectly the first time. I'm, I'm throwing the, the, the medium tempo track at you right away. And so don't don't fret. Um, now, let's talk about the polyrhythm chapter real quick, because, as you know, polyrhythms are the most difficult difficult rhythmic concept in music and the, sometimes they're really difficult to teach students and so there's a number of things obviously the polyrhythm chapter is all going to be two-handed um, except for there's this really fun little um, duet that you can just speak and so what happens in this one is um, one of the uh, this if you have a classroom, actually, it works really nicely where half of the students do the top line, half of the students do the bottom line. And what happens is on the X's, their syllables line up. And the, the beautiful thing about polyrhythms to tell students is that polyrhythms always have something that lines up. And that's kind of their security blanket. That's what they need is to know when to feel those. So hopefully this video works because you'll, um, you'll be able to do it with me. And um, it sounds pretty cool. All right, here we go. What I want you to do for this one is to say the bottom line on the first time through and then switch and do the top line on the second time through. What will happen is I'm going to do the opposite of you. I'm going to do the top line on the first time through and the bottom line on the second time through. And then you'll see how these dovetail and the students then can hear which syllables actually go together on the beat and which ones are just slightly off as in a polyrhythm. So you're taking the uh, bottom line first. One, four, one, two, take the bottom line, ready, go. Listen me, listen me, do the eighth notes. Listen me now, keep the B on top line. Listen me, listen me, do the eighth notes. Listen me now to keep the B. And if you did it right, then you should have hear, heard this dovetail. Maybe I said it wrong, you never know sometimes. In a group of people though, it sounds really awesome to have half the people doing one, half the people doing the other, and then the syllables line up so beautifully. All right, again, that one's really fun to do in a group of people, but keep in mind that rhythm menagerie and manipulations was originally designed to work just in individual lessons. I didn't think about it in group lessons initially, but then as I was working on it, I realized, oh wait, this is gonna work well in group lessons too. So there's lots of different things that you can do, um, whether you're doing just one-on-one -on -one lessons or you're doing it in groups, it works well both ways. Now, I gotta talk to you about what I discovered about polyrhythms when I did this. All right, so um, polyrhythms are lovely, right? Um, so in, in two against three, you've got this together, left, right, left. And, um, you know, I've always been taught to teach this as um, not difficult, not difficult. Well, in, in um, dealing with two against three, the least common multiple of two and three is six. So if you draw a graph or this, this kind of, these kinds of boxes, you can see that that's actually correct. They start together, there's a little bit of a pause, and then they go back and forth, and then there's a pause after that. So, t um, so um, not difficult, not difficult, right? Well, then I was taught to teach four against three, you should say not very difficult. Well, nobody told me that it was supposed to sound a little off. And so I just started teaching it as not very difficult, not very difficult, right? Because that's the rhythmic way to say not very difficult. Well, if you look at it, look what it is. Oh my goodness, those notes are closer together right there where those arrows are. Well, here's what I, this, here's how I discovered this. I was working on these tracks with these uh, musicians and they sent me the track with this four against three polyrhythm. And I was listening to just the track of that, not the accompaniment music surrounding it. I was kind of proofing it. And I listened to it and I was like, that's not right. Oh, they, that's not right. And so I typed up this email. That's not right. I think we need to look at this again, blah, blah, blah. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. Maybe I should just double check. So I put the stuff in finale. I put four against three in finale. And then I listened and I was like, wait, finale's wrong too. <laughs> and um, I mean, that sounds so ridiculous, right? So this computer program that's supposed to be mathematical is wrong. But I just thought that's, oh my goodness, finale's wrong too. And I kept doubting it, um, even though it was right in front of my face. And so then I thought, okay, wait, I'm going to make sure that this is right. And so I had my son, my high school son, who's good at math, just check my math, you know, 
least common multiple of four and three is 12, right? So am I laying this out right? And so I laid it out right. And oh my goodness, look at this. It's really not very difficult. Not very difficult. Not very difficult. Was that the way you learned it? You know, maybe my teacher taught it to me the right way. Maybe I learned it the right way. And then as you do it in faster tempos, you just don't realize how they're, you know, slightly different. And so you just don't hear that. But I was just flabbergasted and really quite embarrassed <laughs> that um, all of these years, I think I've been teaching it improperly and tried to have my students really do this even sounding rhythm, not very difficult, not very difficult, and it's completely wrong. So what you'll find in these polyrhythms tracks is that you might need um, to maybe brush up on your polyrhythms against, uh, especially four against three, because um, they sound a little different than what I think we've been taught or some people have been taught. So I'm going to play this one for you, and you'll even see on the video that mine are, I'm still working on them. I'm at these TEF tempos it's hard enough to play a polyrhythm as, as it is. But at these um, at these tempos, playing it correctly and then playing it knowing this new little piece of information, which maybe it wasn't new to me, but at least was a discovery about my current state. Um, it's just fascinating. So here's this video about polyrhythms. Now, the polyrhythm chapter is definitely the most difficult. And if you as a teacher get to it and you're like, oh my goodness, I can't do some of this, that is okay. I am still um, getting my polyrhythms to be right in terms of where they fall. And so don't feel badly if you can't do the fast facts of these, they are tough. But again, teenagers like that challenge and if they can get that challenge, they just feel absolutely awesome. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the medium track for this one and uh, see if you can get the polyrhythms on it. Two and three and four, nice and slow. One and two and three and four and All right. Um, I was reading the comments. Oh, there we go. I, I was reading the comments as um, as I was playing that video. And who is it that said this? Um, uh, Susie, you just you just made it perfect. She says the way she says is cook the big fat chicken. And if you say that right, it's actually the right rhythm. Cook the big fat chicken. Cook the big fat chicken. Oh my goodness, Susie, you've just saved the day for polyrhythms for me. So very good. Okay, so you don't have to worry so much about the math if you cook the big fat chicken. There you go. Oh my goodness, that's yay. Thank you so much, Susie. All right, um, so let's see. Um, so now let's talk real quick about how to fit this in. A lot of teachers say, well, how do I fit this in? My lessons are already um, full of other things. Before you ask that question, ask yourself what the foundation of the question is. Um, you're still thinking about it potentially as a, a, a precursor, or not a precursor, but a, as a um, thing that's like side by side in terms of importance, when really uh, rhythm is the most fundamental skill for music making. And if you really believe that, then rhythm should, of course, not only um, be okay to prioritize, but it's right to prioritize it, especially in the first few years of lessons. It's very important to prioritize it. And especially these days, I mean, what an opportunity now. I mean, I, I hate that um, singing is considered um, kind of a dangerous thing right now with COVID that's, that's tragic and um, horrible. But at the same time, what a wonderful opportunity to use this as time to work on rhythm, which can really then help the students when you are able to sing again. Um, so three to four minutes of weekly lesson time, if we're talking about piano lessons, you could certainly use 30 minutes on it during a music class or a group lesson. But if you spend three or four minutes of weekly lesson time, you will see improvements. If they're practicing it at home, teachers say there's lots of improvements that happen when they use it consistently. Um, five minutes is great too, but just consider 
um, just how important it is and how much it will benefit all of their music making, whether they continue the same instrument they're taking from you or they quit that instrument and they're just singing the rest of their life or they're, they um, pick up another instrument. All of that rhythm is really beneficial for them. Um, remember that it's good for individual lessons, groups and classrooms. Like I said, I, I present it and a lot of times people can easily see how it's good for groups and classrooms, but then um, teachers will wonder, well, what about individual lessons? It was originally designed to work with my individual individual students, and then it's just easily adaptable for groups and classrooms as well. So what, how to do this teaching online? First of all, we just have to admit that simultaneous clapping is challenging, right? It's pretty much impossible with things like Zoom. And if you'll um, stick around at the end, I've got a couple of suggestions that somebody sent to me for um, for platforms that are better than Zoom, they say, and I have not tried any of them yet, but I will tell you what those are here when we do a Q&A. But anyway, just traditional um, FaceTime and Zoom and things like that, simultaneous clapping is a little challenging because of the delay. So a couple of things that you can do. You can turn them down. You don't have to completely mute them, but if you're in an individual lesson, you can turn them down, play the tracks on your end, and clap the rhythm on your end and have them do it with you. Now, they're gonna do it with you and you're gonna see that they're a little bit off. Ignore that and just let them try it. It's kind of, you don't have to correct every little thing when you're first introducing a rhythm. So show it to them, have them do it with you, but turn them down so it doesn't drive you crazy. And then you can turn them back up and say, okay, now why did you clap it back to me? And let's see how you're doing with it. And then you could see if they've really learned it. And then you could do it again with the tracks and have them clap it with you now that they've learned it a little bit better. Um, play rhythm tag. So what you can do is you can do a first, uh, the first measure, dum, 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 dum. There's going to be a slight delay, but such is the nature of where we are in life right now. And that's okay. And then they'll do the second measure slight delay, you'll do the third measure. It'll feel seamless to them in terms of when they start doing it back to you, but um, there will be a little bit of delay and that's just the way it is right now. But think about this. You are working on so much more music where you're not delaying between measures. So a little bit of delay during you know, two months of, of online lessons or even six months of, of online lessons is not going to make or break them in terms of teaching them not to delay at the bar line. Um, teaching online for, with groups or with classrooms, again, you can mute them and then play the tracks and rhythm on your end. And then you can unmute individuals to check. Well, um, you know, Sally, let's see how you're doing with the rhythm. Have, let's, let's have you do it. Or Jeffrey, let's have you do it. And you can individually check each of them. Um, playing rhythm tag, again, ignore the delay. There's all kinds of things that I, like ideas that I have, but I don't have a big group that I can um, test it with. But um, maybe we'll talk about this at the end when there's questions and answers. But um, there's all kinds of things that you can do to adapt to this. It's not going to be perfect, just so you know. Um, nothing is perfect right now, um, but um, it certainly um, it certainly can work during um, this time of COVID and definitely um, after and when we're in person again. All right, just real quick, how does Rhythm Cup Explorations fit into this curriculum? All right, I'm going to send you this chart after um, a couple of hours here um, after I end this. But my first Rhythm Cup Explorations is really that basic um, book that teaches about um, steady beat, quarter notes, half notes, and really um, goes in a nice sequential comprehensive way for those early level students and those young students. And then the next book that makes sense in terms of developing core um, innate curriculum with your students is Rhythm Menagerie. And so I would work out of Menagerie and then Manipulations comes after that. I would work out of that weekly and then use Rhythm Cup Explorations as a supplement. So for example, in unit one of Rhythm Menagerie, you remember there's three units. Uh, excuse me, three levels. And so when they finish level one, do a rhythm cups page. When they finish level two, do a rhythm cups page. When they finish level three, do a rhythm cups page. Or if they're working in groups, do a rhythm cups page. So there's all sorts of ways to supplement it and still get that um, fun aspect of all of these things in here, but still really, really work on getting it in their bodies. I'll send you this chart as well as this chart. This chart is actually a scope and sequence chart. So for example, if you're using um, 
if you're teaching dotted quarter notes, you might want to know where all the dotted quarter notes are introduced in these books. And so it'll tell you where in Rhythm Menagerie it is and where in Rhythm Cup Explorations it is. If you're introducing polyrhythms, you might want to know where exactly in these books are, is this concept. And so some, some of the concepts have different books that they use. Um, so there's lots of different material and then others, like for instance, polyrhythms are just in rhythm manipulations. So I'll send you these things. I'm also going to send you a um, certificate of um, professional development. And so um, those of you who need that for um, school um, or for continuing education, you can use that for attending this webinar today. So I will send that to you. You'll get it by tomorrow. Well, tomorrow morning for some of you, but at least within the next five or six hours. Okay, a couple things about the format. These are PDF books. We don't sell hard copies, but they're this way so that they can be super flexible. Um, they're reproducible for students that you personally directly teach. So you can print them for all your students if you want. You could use them on a projector. So that's why it's in a PDF. You can put them on a Promethean board. It's very versatile the way that you can use them. You only ever need to purchase them one time. So it's not like one of those method books where you have to purchase 10 books for your 10 students. You only purchase it once and then you can use it for each of your students that you're directly um, teaching. Um, you can use them with as many students or as classrooms as you directly teach. So if you have five classrooms of 30 students apiece, then um, you can teach this to 150 students. If you've got 10 piano students, you can teach it to all 10 students. You're not limited um, by the number of students you teach. You're just limited in the fact that each teacher needs their own license. So it can't be shared even in a multi-teacher studio. Each teacher that's going to teach from it or is going to use it would need their own license. Um, you can print the PDF, like I said, for any student you directly teach, and especially for um, private teachers, you would charge them for the price of the printings like you would for a book. You can't resell the book, so you can't make a profit on it, but you can charge them for the price of the printing. Um, and then there's been a temporary license change since COVID. Um, we want to be flexible and make things easy as possible for teachers. And so um, right now, um, at least through December the 31st, maybe longer, um, you can just directly email it to your students and that way you don't have to worry about um, making a print for them. You can directly email it to them. They can put it on their iPad um, and um, and then you can distribute it to your students in that way. Um, just a quick note, the tracks are not shareable though. We've always, uh, we've always sold those separately and um, the students have to purchase them if they would like to use them at home. So um, they're on sale right now at the best price ever, both the Rhythm Menagerie and the Manipulations tracks. So now's a good time even for students to get them, but don't purchase them for your students because the parents are gonna wanna download it themselves and have it in their own account so they can re-download it if they need it and there's a, it's hard to transfer files amongst people. Um, and so you'll want them to purchase their own so that they can keep track of those on their own. And then again, like I said, you can re-download these at any time. I get emails um, every month about um, teachers whose computers crashed and they lose everything, and um, which is really sad. And I'm sorry, I hope that's not what happened to my other computer that recently died, um, as in like two hours ago. But anyway, um, you don't have to purchase it again. You can just re-log into your account and you can just re-download it again. So only ever have to purchase it one time. Okay, so the specials that we have right now are for this week only. Um, this sale lasts for all of these things last through this Friday, August the 28th, and it expires 11.59 Central. It's actually Central Daylight Time right now. There's no coupon code needed because we don't want you to forget the coupon code and then not get the discount. That's not very fair. And so we just um, priced um, the, um, we've slashed the prices basically. And then just a quick note um, before I show you the specials and so you can put them on your card if you're interested. Um, uh, only purchase the bundle if you don't have any of the items because we can't um, piecemeal. Um, unfortunately, our system doesn't allow you to take one thing out and put one thing in or anything like that. So if you don't have any of the items and you want to purchase a bundle, great. Um, but otherwise, a lot of the things are on sale um, as smaller bundles. So you can look at it in that way. All right. So real quick, um, the accompaniment tracks are what a lot of people need right now. If you already have rhythm manipulations, um, then all you might need is the accompaniment track. And if that's the case, um, those are on sale. Um, normally, they would be $51.99. They're on sale for $41.99. And so in the side of the chat, if you'll see that, if you see that little red tab with the three dots, 
click it if you don't see the chat right now and pull it out and you'll see that there's this little offer right here and there's a blue button that says add to cart. You can just add that to your cart right now. It'll take you to a different, um, a different tab and you can check out later if you want. It doesn't automatically check you out, I promise. You can always remove these things as well if you decide there's a different bundle that you want. So that is the Rhythm manipul Manipulations Tracks Only. There's also a bundle of just the PDF book and the accompaniment track. So if you already own Rhythm Menagerie and you want Rhythm Manipulations and the accompaniment tracks, then this offer is for that. Now, there are two different versions of rhythm manipulations. And I want to explain what those are really quickly. Um, there's the North American version, which is the um, the offer that I have right now. You can see there's North American in the blue button. The North American version refers to rhythm with terms such as quarter, half, eight, sixteenth. Um, but the international version refers and use, um, uses rhythm terms like crotchet, minim, quaver, semi-quaver. And so I'm going to take off the North American version and put the international one on. So if you want the American one, be sure to get that one. We can always give you the link later too. Um, but I'm also going to put up the international one right now so you can see that. And I know that my talking is not always syncing with what I'm putting up there. So just watch what that button says, and it should show you um, what exactly you're putting in your cart if you're interested. Then there's the bundle of Rhythm Menagerie, Rhythm Manipulations, and the accompaniment tracks that go with this. There are 750 accompaniment tracks. I forgot to say that for Rhythm Manipulations. And they are very neatly organized into units. So you, you um, download a zip file and extract the zip file by clicking it. It extracts folder and all of the, um, of the, um, tracks for unit one are in that folder. And so it's really slick um, and it really helps you stay organized. Now um, with this bundle, so it comes with all the accompaniment tracks, there's 800, excuse me, 750 manipulations, 865 uh, rhythm menagerie tracks, I think. Um, with this also comes the North American and international versions, right? And so you have to think about that. But there's one more thing to note, and that is that there's something called the piano and the classroom version. And so the piano version is for if you're a piano teacher and your students all have access to a piano, you would want the piano version. Um, here's the the difference between piano and classroom. The only thing that's different is the introductory page. So on the introductory pages of the piano version, it says things like play this rhythm with a fifth on the piano or play this rhythm with a high note on the piano. But in the classroom version, it's going to work for any instrument. So for instance, sometimes it's just singing, sing this rhythm on law. And of course, like I said, with singing, you can easily replace that with their instrument, play this uh, note with an instrument. Um, and other things that it says is play this note with an, a low note on your instrument. So if you're a voice teacher, it could be la, 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 or it could be a high note or something like that. And so all of those um, instructions in the classroom version are specific to um, specific to not specific to the piano. So it's more generalized. So I'm going to go ahead and um, put up the different um, the different versions here. So the one I have up right now, you probably already see it, is the international uh, piano version. So again, if you're a piano teacher, but you need terms like crotchet, minimum, quaver, um, semi, semi quaver, then that would be the addition that you would want for that. So those are the four um, different permutations of this particular um, set of books, menagerie, where the manipulations and the accompaniment tracks for all of those. All right, and then the, a couple other things that we're running a special on right now. Um, two years ago is when we came out with the accompaniment tracks for Rhythm Menagerie. And um, these accompaniment tracks have not been on sale since we first um, we first brought them out. So if you still just have the PDF books of Manipulations and Rhythm Menagerie, then um, you can get the accompaniment tracks today on sale. So I'm gonna go ahead and put um, those offer or that offer on here. And so again, your, your students can also purchase these. This would be a, a good time for them to purchase if they're interested. The last thing I just want to talk about, but there's no, I'm not going to put an offer on the side, is the Rhythm Curriculum Bundle. I know a lot of school uh, classroom teachers like to use this. Piano teachers have purchased this as well. It looks like um, it's expensive, but remember, it's not when you put 
uh, together the fact that you only ever have to purchase it once and you've got everything then. You've got holiday Rhythm Cup Explorations. You've got Rhythm Cup Explorations pre-Rhythm Cup. My first Rhythm Cup Explorations, uh, book one, book two, for the Menagerie, the Manipulations. You've got way more than um, uh, you'll need in one year. And so you can keep teaching from it over and over again. There's progress charts for Rhythm uh, Menagerie. And if you're interested in this, you can just go to composecreate.com slash rhythm dash curriculum dash bundle it's also in the store so you can browse to find it as well but that we do have as well all right i want to go over some um uh questions i know there's questions in the chat and i'm going to get to those in just a minute but i also know that these questions always come up and so i want to make sure i ask or answer these questions one of the biggest questions is can i download the tracks to my ipad Yes, you've always been able to do this, but what's really exciting is we discovered the other day that the latest iOS version, version 13, allows you to tap to add it to your file. So once you get the zip file, you click on to download the zip file and it'll show the zip file. It'll show a dot zip and it'll ask what you want to do it. And you click more and then you can tap save to files. When you save it to your files, you now have a files map app on your iPad and your iPhone, and um, you can tap the zip file and it will extract the, um, the folder. And then you can see all of your tracks there in that folder and you can play them from your folder. Now, what's really cool is that you can now do a split screen on your iPad. I don't know if you can do it on your iPhone or not, but you can do a split screen on your iPad and you can actually, you can have it go half and half or like we've got, we've got like a two thirds and one third and you can show the tracks in one and show the PDF on the other, which is so cool. Um, and you can just be working on with them at the same time. And what what re what it really is, is you're opening two different files and then you're just merging them basically using the split screen. And we've got links on our facts page um, to the Apple site that tells you how to do it. We don't provide support for um, Apple things, but um, they're so good at showing you how to do it, whether you're in an Apple store or you call them on the phone and their instructions are really good too. So we had to tap around a little bit to figure out how to do it. That's what you always have to do on an iPad. But it was pretty cool when we figured it out. So, OK, um, teachers have asked, what's different in the revised edition of Rhythm Manipulations? Do I really need to download it if I um, have the old version? Here's what's different. Many of the rhythms, like I said, have been revised slightly to make them even more musical. Um, some pages had no revisions and then other pages had three revisions and so other pages just had one revision in one measure. But it was enough that I stopped keeping track <laughs> because um, there was just a lot of little revisions, but the revisions were to make everything more musical. Track numbers, of course, have been added. So if you are going to be using the tracks, you definitely want the new version, especially because those rhythms are different in the new version. And then some minor edits um, that you probably didn't even notice um, have been made. All right, so here's um, some news that a lot of you are waiting for. Um, if you have previously purchased Rhythm Manipulations, you might be wondering, how can I get the revised edition? Is there a discount for buying it? Um, the good news is you don't have to purchase it. We're giving you the revised edition if you want, if you've purchased it in the past. Um, so I know that we could probably take advantage of this. A lot of publishers just will sell the revised edition again, but we decided that we just want you to have the revised edition. And so what you need to do is um, just download it again from your account. So if you checked out as a guest previously, then you just go to your um, receipt and you find the um, download for rhythm manipulations. You can um, download it again. Download that again. If you have an account, you can just go to composecreate.com/my-account. Once you get in there, you'll see a place where you can click on downloads. So you'll click on downloads, and then all your downloads will be on the right side. This has gone through a little bit of revisions uh, lately. We updated some things. It was a big update, but you just small changes that you see. Anyway, so now your downloads are green buttons, which is great because it makes it easier. Um, but you can also um, search your downloads. So if you want to just type in the word rhythm, then you can actually see all, all of the um, purchases that you've purchased with the word rhythm in there will come up. So it's really handy. And we've just tried to make everything a lot easier um, for uh, teachers. And hopefully that's good news to you. So 
All right. Um, on the next screen, I'm going to put links to everything. You may not want to type these kinds of things in. So if you need a link, let us know. We can give you a clickable link. But right now, what I want to do is um, answer some of the questions that you guys have written in live. Um, to ask a question, make sure you mark your question as a question. And um, that way it gets in my queue for questions because I will not see everything because the chat's uh, crowded with all of your wonderful um, comments and all of the way you guys ways you guys are helping um, each other, which I love. So, okay, let's see. Um, let's see, um, a lot of people are just saying thanks for the PD certificate, professional development. Great. Um, when I teach piano at our summer music camp, am I allowed to use it then? I have been curious about that. If it's just you teaching from it, yes. So Hannah, the answer to your question is if it's only you are teaching from it, then yes, you can teach it to as many students as you connect with. Um, if another teacher wants to teach it, they would have to purchase it also. So hopefully that um, answers that question. Um, how do I send the sale information to um, parents? Um, that's a good idea. Basically, you just um, are a good question. That's uh, you basically just need the links. This is Diane's question. So, Diane, um, I can write in really quickly. Actually, I should probably have my um, I'm going to have my moderator do this because I can't type in. Um, type and um, talk at the same time. I can barely talk at all. Anyway, um, so if my moderator would go ahead and put the um, links to the Rhythm Menagerie tracks and the Rhythm Manipulations tracks in the chat, then you can copy that and just paste it in an email and send it to your parents. Um, also, um, just note that everything um, the, you can go to the store, just composecreate.com slash shop, and you'll see different categories. If you click on the rhythm category, you'll see all of these things that we've talked about tonight. And um, you can just real quick grab the link from that as well. So, all right, let's see what else. Um, um, Laura is asking about um, students purchasing the tracks and about basically, you know, do parents really um, purchase these? Well, it depends on how you present it. Um, if you um, if you believe that rhythm is that integral to the student's development, then investing in a set of tracks that are going to last for several years. This is not a method book they're going to get through in six months. OK, um, so if they're going to last for several years. If the family has more than one student, it's a huge investment. And when they see it's 750 tracks or 865 tracks and they do the math, it ends up, I can't remember being 0.09, less than nine cents a track, maybe even less than that. Um, I'd have to do the math again. Um, but anyway, if you're convinced that that is um, a good investment for that student, then it's well worth um, their money and you will be able to easily um, convince them to do that. You ask them to purchase method books all the time um, and you ask them to purchase it, purchase it multiple times a year and that adds up. But this is an all-in-one rhythm curriculum that makes a huge difference in every aspect of that student. And so you can definitely tell the parents, well, you know, um, even if your child doesn't continue in piano lessons, are they going to sing? Are they going to maybe pick up the guitar? Are they going to take a band instrument in, in, in um, school? All of this rhythm work hugely impacts all of those things. And there's nothing else. <laughs> I don't, I don't think maybe I'm biased, but there's nothing else that they could purchase and work on that would have as many um, positive implications, I think on musical um, ability and musical musicianship. So if you're convinced of that, you can make an easy case to them and, and parents will be convinced as well. They're looking to you as the professional. So they'll kind of take their cues from you. It's a great question. All right. Um, Lisa asks, so what happens if I think I own rhythm manip manipulations, but it's not in my download area of the Compose Create site? Um, just email me there. Um, sometimes people check out as guests or sometimes, a, you know, occasionally a weird thing happens with an order um, where it doesn't show up in your downloads. And I can help you with that. Email me support at composecreate.com. That's the best way to make sure your emails get noticed and answered as quickly as possible. Um, so email me and just let me know you can't find it. I'm happy to help you uh, make sure that you can get it. So, all right, let's see. 
Um, oh, Christine says, if I bought Rhythm Cup Explorations a long time ago and now find there's a My First Rhythm Cup Explorations, which came out next year or last year, excuse me, can I buy My First Rhythm Cup Explorations separately? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I can get you links to that really quickly. First Rhythm Cup Explorations, here we go. Right here is My First Rhythm Cup Explorations, and I'll put this in the comments. Um, and this is basically that first uh, book of Rhythm Cup Explorations that um, that you can use to help establish a beat. I tested it in a kindergarten classroom. I tested it in a preschool classroom as well. Four-year-olds four -year did it really well. Three-year-olds had fun, but, you know, some of them weren't quite ready, and that's okay. Um, the five-year-olds in the kindergarten were fabulous. First grade, I even uh, tested it in second grade, and so um, so – um, it works with those ages as well. So good question. Um, Michelle asked, I think this question came back earlier in or came up earlier in the uh, webinar. Um, how good is it in Google Classroom? I have not personally used it in Google Classroom, so I couldn't tell you, but hopefully those ideas that I was giving to you um, in using over Zoom um, will be helpful to you and can hopefully be something that um, you can use for Google Classroom. I did want to see if I could find this uh, real quick. Yes, there was a couple. Now, um, I I'm going to give you I'm going to give you a couple of links to things that a teacher told me. A couple of teachers have mentioned this that these two um, what do you call it broadcast broadcast platforms um, are much better than Zoom. Um, I think one of them even claims to be able to do simultaneous um, music, so duets and, of course, Rhythm Cup Explorations. And so I'm going to give these to you, but please know that I am not necessarily endorsing them. I haven't seen them, um, but um, just check them out if you're interested to see. Um, I'm fascinated. If one of you does check them out, please let me know how well it works for you. I'm very interested in this, and obviously, whoever is um, whoever is um, doing this has really, um, you know, seen a need and is trying to meet it. So I'm excited about this if it's really all that great. So, okay. Um, um, somebody asked, can the MP3s be downloaded on more than one device that I own? Absolutely. If you're the only person using them, you could you could download it to five different devices. If you've got three computers and you use it periodically, you could download it to all three of your computers. As long as you're the only one using them, um, then you can do that. Oops, I think I just unquestioned somebody's um, question. So if I don't get to your question, be sure to put it back in there. Um, where do you get the public, or excuse me, the professional development certificate? Um, just hang on for a couple of hours and my system's gonna send it to you automatically. All right. Could this be used as theory, having a hard time establishing a working theory method in my teaching? Um, certainly the theory of rhythm is in here. Um, I don't have any kind of theory in terms of note names or other aspects that you usually work on music theory, but this covers rhythm really, really comprehensively. So um, you can definitely use this as a rhythm curriculum. And if that will count as partial uh, partial theory, I'm not sure if you're a classroom teacher or not, but um, if that will count as part of that, it, it might. Um, but it definitely doesn't cover all the things we usually talk about when it comes to music theory. Um, okay, Catherine asks, menagerie is elementary students and manipulations is intermediate. Is that right? Basically, yes. And so... Um, um, manipulations picks up where menagerie leaves off and, you know, sometimes that line is kind of fuzzy. And so, um, you know, you have dotted quarter notes in the, um, in the menagerie book, and that's usually late elementary, um, for piano teachers, at least here in the United States. And then you get to cut time, compound meter and 16th notes. And a lot of that is usually early intermediate. So yes, I would agree with that. Although just remember, you know, you know how these things are. Leveling is just really hard um, sometimes, but okay. Um, Jan says, is the cup, uh, rhythm cup explorations, um, a PDF or book. All of these rhythm resources are PDFs. You can certainly make them into a books by having them a book by having them spiral bound. Um, and um, and I definitely would encourage you to do that. It's nice to have something, especially if you like the physical book. Um, but we do deliver them to you as a PDF resource, and that way um, you have lots of flexibility where you can show it digitally or show it on a Promethean board or um, or just print it. So. 
Uh, let's see. Um, Lisa was asking about, have you ever considered the possibility of purchasing one unit at a time for the tracks? Not really. It just makes things really complicated um, for teachers and for the system. And so we just sell them all at once because they would have to be coming back over and over again to purchase the next unit. Um, and so um, that's um, probably... Um, Probably not something that we'll do, but we're always, you know, we're always open to ideas. And we were talking about a question somebody else had asked earlier that had to do with something about that, um, not about tracks, but about payments. So, um, you know, just know that we're always taking these questions and thinking about them. So, all right. Um, Gwen says, will you be creating some tracks that are more classical based in the future? The good news is I didn't mention this. I'm sorry. I, I sometimes mention forget to mention things, but these tracks spread the gamut. So there's classical tracks on it. As a matter of fact, there's one unit, um, I think it was uh, six, eight. It's really hard to make um, pop sounding music in six, eight. And so that music was especially classical. So there's lots of of different styles within every single unit. They're not just rock or, um, you know, uh, hard kind of styles. So um, let's see. Um, Christine asked to teach this to a community choir, say, for example, a community, a community choir, does the organization need to buy it or is the purchase by the teacher for their own studio applicable? Um, always individuals are the only people that can technically own it. So an organization is not going to be able to own it because only one teacher can use it and, um, and um, have the license. So it would need to be the teacher that purchased it. But if you're asking about well, what if that teacher also has piano students and I want to use it also in this community um, application? Can I do that? Yes. As long as you're the only teacher teaching from it, you can use it in so many different areas. It's really a huge value, especially if you do those kinds of things. If you're using I had one teacher say that she was using it with her handbell choir at church as well as her piano students. So she can do that. And um, as long as you're the only teacher teaching with it then um, you're good. Uh, how do you know if you're downloading the revised edition? Good question. Um, where is my picture? Um, uh, I'd have to go back pretty far. But um, if you download it right now, if you re-download it now, you know it's the revised edition because we took out the old edition. So if you actively go to a receipt of uh, in the past or you actively go to your account and you download it, you know you're going to get the new edition um, because the, the old edition isn't even in our system anymore. And so you'll want to delete the old edition, though, in your computer because they're named the same thing. And so when you open the new um, PDF, you'll see immediately that there's this, this star on the on the front that says revised edition. And that will tell you immediately on the front cover whether you have the revised edition or not. All right. Let's see. When are the revisions going to be available for redownload if we've already purchased Menagerie and Manipulations? They're already available. Um, Menagerie does not have a revised edition this year. We revised that two years ago. So if you um, did not download the revised edition two years ago and you already owned it, um, then you can go ahead and download that today. If you've bought it in the last two years, you already have the revised edition of Rhythm Men Menagerie. Rhythm Manipulations, we just uploaded that a couple of days ago. So um, all you have to do is just go in, like I said, and go to your account or go to your receipt and re-download it. And the new one is the one that's going to come down and go into your downloads folder. So. All right. Um, are there other questions? Make sure that you type um, your questions in the um, box, but you also mark it as a question. There's a little place, the little thing that says send to everybody. Click on those three dots and you'll see there's a choice to mark something as a question. Um, or I, I, maybe mine looks a little different than yours, but right above you where you make your comment, don't make your comment, but right above it, Mark it as a question and then make your comment and it should send to just me. Um, someone asked Marilyn, Marilyn asked, what are the alternate streaming services? Again, I'll um, give you these that someone else gave me just today. Um, and just notice that I'm I'm commenting as a moderator for some reason. It's saying I'm a moderator, not Wendy. Um, but um, 
anyway, just remember that I've never tried these before. I'm not endorsing them. I have no experience with them at all. They've just been suggested to me. So check them out and let me know how they work for you. Uh, Lisa asked a good question. So are there new tracks and PDF for manipulations? Yes, there's completely new tracks because we never had tracks before. So you never would have purchased them before yesterday because we didn't even have tracks available. So the tracks are brand new. No tracks existed before now for manipulations. The PDF is a revised edition of manipulations. You do not need to purchase it again if you already own it. You just need to re-download it again and we're going to let you have that revised edition. So all right. Um, would the Menagerie book be appropriate for young adults with disabilities? That's a really good question, Donna. And I haven't really used it um, for students with disabilities. I will tell you, though, um, I don't see why it couldn't be um, used for them. But I'll also tell you that I do have a number of teachers that have told me that Rhythm Cup Explorations really works um, with students, some of their students um, with um, ch learning challenges. There's some autistic students that really have really um, um, like severely autistic students that have really um, done really well with this. Um, so so maybe um, I would would think that because it's carefully graded and, um, you know, it can be as slow or as fast moving as you want it to be. I would think that it would definitely um, be something that would work better than anything that I know of simply because it's more musical, it's more logical um, and all of those things. So, um, but to be honest, I have not tried it with um, adult students with disabilities, so I can't tell you exactly. So, okay, let's see, I've answered these questions. Um, Carlin says, any chance that the tracks might be made available as CDs instead of having to down them, download and create them, create CDs from them? No, um, we're just going to only make those available as MP3s. It's just um, um, CDs is just too much for us to keep track of and too much inventory and things like that. So we probably won't make those available as CDs. But you already said, you know, you can download them and um, and make them uh, make your MP3s, burn them to a CD on your computer or have a student help you with that. So, all right. Um, OK, well, I've answered all the questions that are at least popping on my screen for questions. So I just want to say real quick, um, if you have any other questions, don't hesitate to email me. Um, the best way to get a hold of me for the fastest response is support at composecreate.com. That um, email actually is a lot cleaner for me. And so I see your messages a lot easier and it's easier for me to get back to you. Um, and I'm in that in email all the time anyway. So I'm going to be monitoring that a lot this week, especially, and we'll even be staying up late on Friday um, when the sale closes um, to help you with any other um, questions that you might have. Julie asked a good question. She said, how sale, how long is this sale going on? It's this Friday at midnight central daylight time. So you should get a reminder on Friday morning about the sale. You also should get a follow-up email today or in a couple of hours, um, about, um, all the sales with links to them and things like that. Um, so you can have a couple of days to think about, um, how that, um, how that will work for you and what you need. So, um, let's see any other questions that I can answer. I really appreciate you guys spending um, your evening or maybe it's your early morning with me. I hope it's beneficial to you. And I'm mean, just really, um, I can't thank you enough. Um, I'm glad that things went fairly well. I'm going to have to figure out what's wrong with my, um, seemingly dead computer, but thank you all for, um, bearing with the little things we had to test and um, just um, just coming tonight and um, definitely look for that um, email that should be coming with your professional development certificate, as well as those um, downloads for the scope and sequence chart and things like that. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. I really appreciate um, and um, I really appreciate um, you coming and um, don't hesitate to reach out. I'll be on chat for just a few more minutes before I close out the session. So don't hesitate to put another question in if you need to. Um, and then I'll just be on email after that. So thanks again. Have a good evening. Have a good morning. Have a good day wherever you are. And thanks again for coming.